Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, class. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today, not only as president of New Hampshire School Administrators Association, but also as the superintendent of schools here in Manchester. We welcome to you our, our city, and we hope you have an adva uh, take advantage of uh, going around the city when you have a moment or two and add some revenue to our school district budget. So we really appreciate that. Our motto, the New Hampshire School Administrators Association, is we are for the ch uh, champion for children. That's what we are talking about. That's what we believe in. Our members are very happy to co-sponsor this event because we have been challenged over the years in terms of how we deliver our educational processes and our instruction. Everyone is aware of the need of technology and the direction we need to go in developing that technology. This is our special year. This is our 26th anniversary. Uh, we look around and we see a lot of uh, people here and we hope to see this to continue to expand over the upcoming years. And what it's really about is providing opportunity for you to participate and understand best practices. It is about the best practices that we learn and that we can pass on to our students. We, have, we are very proud of what we've done over the last few years in terms of allowing you to grow, as well as allowing you to grow in a way that you can allow students to grow. That's what it's all about. That's what we believe in. That's what you are here, why you are here. It's a matter of growth, both in terms of our students as well as you. It is my pleasure to introduce a distinguished keynote speaker this morning, excuse me, Scott Kenny. Now, I have five pages of introduction for Scott, and Scott said, forget it, don't do that. And I've always been known to speak off script, which I've done throughout my initial discussion or introduction. But I can tell you one thing about Scott. Scott began his career as a public educator. For 15 years, he worked in public education on, as we say, on the front line. He learned and realized that things needed to change and that we should take advantage of what's out there, not only in terms of technology, simply to have it in the classroom, but to provide staff and students the opportunity to experience and grow, as I said earlier, through technology. He is here today to talk about the transition from print to digital. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Kenny. <laughs> Good morning. So where are my 14 people who responded? Go ahead, show a hand. Very, let's, let's give a round of applause for our bell ringer activity participants. Very nicely done. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're here for, but before we get started, I want you to respond to this question. So I know you just heard, turn your cell phones off. Who has a cell phone in here? Anybody? How about, or a web-enabled device? Raise your hand if you have a cell phone or web-enabled device. Nice and high for me, okay. So here's what I want you to do. Take about 60 seconds. I wanna collect some data, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit later why I'm collecting this data, but I want you to answer this question for me. So as you walk around your school systems, how are your teachers delivering instructional content, primarily? Now I recognize it's not just one way, but primarily if you had to pick one, which one would you pick? So there's two ways to respond. One is you can just text one of these keywords, CM text, CM lect, CM med, or CM hand, to 37607. Or you can just go to this URL, pollev.com backslash Scott Kinney, and just answer the question. So I'm going to give you about 60 seconds. I'd love for you to respond. And then I'll give you a little bit more information a little bit later on on why I'm asking the question. Give you about 30 more seconds. And you can continue to answer. So even if I'm off this slide, you can go ahead and keep on uh, finishing your thought. 
So as Tom mentioned, I um, spent 15 years in public education before joining Discovery about seven years ago. And I, I got to tell you, my first, what I call my first real job in education uh, out of college was at a small school district in western Pennsylvania. And I was the first instructional technology coordinator ever in that district and in the county. So anybody ever hold that position, first kind of technology person in their district? Nice and high, so you got one person over there. So it was a really interesting time. It was the early 90s. And at the time, one of the things that um, happened, my first day of work, I remember it uh, like it was yesterday, assistant superintendent gave me a tour of the district, introduced me to a few folks, took me out to lunch, and after lunch handed me this big stack of papers and said, now do whatever it is you do. And so um, it was great because I got to set the vision for the district around how we integrate technology. But in that big stack of papers was a really important grant for something. So early 90s to mid 90s, what do you think that grant was? Any guesses? Come on, shout it out. You're going to have to talk eventually. What do you think? Early 90s. School to work? It was a technology related grant. It was for a 56K line. It was one of the greatest things at the time, right? We were getting the internet for the first time ever. And a good friend of mine, uh, actually my best friend in the district was a high school principal at the time. And I remember we used to sit around and talk about, do you think this thing called the internet will really ever impact education? Uh, and so here we are, years later, and I'm at Discovery where we deliver a lot of our content over that thing called the internet. And so my role at Discovery, as Tom mentioned, is really to work with organizations. So school systems, states, uh, other countries, in making this transition from print to digital. And it's interesting because everybody's talking about this right now, right? So President Obama talked about it as State of the Union address. How do we move from print to digital within the next five years? He empowered a bunch of people like Secretary Duncan. Uh, Margaret Spellings uh, is on something called the Lead Commission that was started by the USDOE and the FCC chairman. Uh, the FCC chairman is involved. How do we make this move? So how do we provide broadband across the country so everybody can take advantage of these things? What's interesting, though, is a lot of these folks aren't talking about why from an educational perspective. And so why I realize that I'm kind of preaching to the converted today, one of the things we're going to talk about is why from an educational perspective. What are the benefits to moving this direction? Because it's not just us in the US, right? It's places like Korea. So you get the idea. Places like Australia, right, who are putting in $2.4 billion in infrastructure just to deliver digital content to school systems across the country. In the U.S., we see people doing it as well. There's a, a school, anybody here in Mooresville, North Carolina? Anybody? So there's a school in North Carolina, a relatively small school, about 8,000 students, who about five years ago made what they call their digital transition. Stop buying textbooks, implemented a one-to-one -one, uh, initiative, and deliver all their instructional content digitally. So let's take a quick listen to uh, what they have to say. Definitely the learning styles are different, you know, we're not doing pencil, paper, writing anymore. It's learning as applied to real life. Um, you're not just seeing a definition, you're experiencing what that thing is. It really widens your horizons because you are able to reach, access way more resources than you could ever access in just a school library. It's changing the world right now because you can literally talk to somebody across the world in a matter of seconds. It's pretty fun. Just typing on the computer. Sometimes I actually look forward to going to school. Well, this is not a project. This is really designing a culture. They talk about their work. And I really think that whether it's teacher work or student work, a, a transference has occurred and that it is in order to do our work, we use 21st century tools. Now admittedly, Mooresville's at one end of this continuum, right? So they're one-to-one, -one, they're all digital. 
Not all of us are there. But if you think of this as a continuum, the idea is how do we as a country and how do you as a system begin to move on that continuum, right? So you're clearly leaders in your school systems, and that's why you're here. And so what are you doing to help move this process along across your entire district? So here's what I want to do. I want to start with a little quiz, and I'm going to test your knowledge of some things this morning. So in every row, there's a little clicker. Okay, so what I want you to do is find that clicker in the row, hold it up nice and high, and I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do two things. You want to get to the nearest clicker, and the two things you want to do when you get to your teams, you have to identify a team captain and a team name. You have 60 seconds, go. Team captain, team name. All right, are we all set? So do me a favor, team captains, raise your hand nice and high. Let's hear from the team captains. Very nice. All right, so uh, on, wow, <laughs> that's good. Can I borrow this real quick? So on top of your pad, there's a number. So if you look on top, there's a number. This number happens to be 18. That's your team number, so that's important. All right, so everybody take a look at your number. Team captains should have the pads in their hands. For example, where is team 14? Team Fort, back there. Ma'am, your name? Joanne. And Joanne, your team name? Us. Uh, team Us, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it for Team Us. Very nice. How about Team 32? Where's Team 32? Back there, sir, your name? Uh, Terrell. Terrell? And your team name, Terrell? Terrell, you had 60 seconds to do two things. What, I'm sorry, what was that? J-O-B? Team J-O-B, very nice. All right, so here's how this works. The top row is never going to change. That's your team number. So if you're team 18, all you care about are these two numbers. The top one's never going to change. You're only focused on these two things. The bottom number is between 1 and 5. There's a little white piece of paper underneath every clicker. It has five questions on it. So team 18 is going to answer question number 1. Okay. So what's going to happen? Team leader is going to read question number one to our team. She's going to gain consensus or not. I don't know what kind of team leader she is. Then she's going to hit A, B, C, or D on the pad and the send button. Okay, very important. You have to hit the send button. A, B, C, or D on the pad, send button. So team 17, what question are they going to answer? Question two. Get it? All right, give it a try. Do one question at a time. So go ahead and answer your first question. You're not allowed to play. <laughs> if you have a real small team, you can join another team. If it turns blue, it means you've answered the question. A, B, C, or D in the send button. Make sure you hit the answer only once. I'll give you about 30 more seconds. About 20 seconds. Ten. Go ahead and lock them in. Nine. Eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, here's how it works. I'm going to click the end button. If you have a green 20, it means you got it correct. Now, where's team 13? Team 13. OK, ma'am, your name? What's your first, I'm sorry, first name? Linnea. Linnea? And Linnea, what's your team name? The Three Musketeers. So the Three Musketeers not only got it correct, they got it correct first, so they got five bonus points. I didn't tell you that part. All right, ready? Next question. Go. Three. 
We're going to speed up a little, so I'm going to give you about 60 seconds. <laughs> I love your team. <laughs> About 30 seconds. So okay. what's wrong with our clicker? Give it a try. So what, what do you want to answer? Send on TMA mode last time it was on a different mode. What'd you hit? So what are you trying to answer? Uh, I try it again. I just hit the clear button. So go ahead and try it. C and then send. But uh, number 22 is never showing up that. Oh, this time it actually went. You just needed me to stand here. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, here we go. Let's see how we did. Oh, interesting. Team 37 that time. Ready? Next question, go. No, it won't take the right answers? All right, about 20 seconds. I think people have the hang of it. Very good. Let's see how we did. Ah, interesting. All right, you ready? Next, go. Two more. Are you a team of one? <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, about 20 seconds. All right, let's see how we did. Oh, one to go. Last one, here we go. Last question. Still no? You know, it's probably my, I probably have the wrong answer key set up. It's ha happened to me once. <laughs> yeah, it did happen to me once. <laughs> All right, about 20 seconds. All right, here we go. Let's take a look. Oh, very interesting. Now, the good part about education is it doesn't really matter who wins or loses. Do you want to see who won and lost? All right, let's see. Let's take a quick look. We'll sort it. This is the one thing I really like about this software. When you click on the score, it actually starts lowest, so we can see who got zeros. We'll do it again. All right. Team 48. Where's Team 48? Over here. Let's hear. Oh, you got to cheer for Team 48. Let's hear for Team 48. Who, who's your team captain? Come on up. What's your name? Mark, come on up. I'll just give you. I'm not going to make you talk. I saw the look on your face. I'm just going to give you something. Let's hear for Mark. What's your team name? KRSD. KRSD. Let's hear for Mark. Very nice. Very nice. All right. You want to see what the correct answers were? It'd be cool, but I don't have that in the presentation. No, I'm kidding. OK, here we go. So first question, after 244 years, who stopped printing their publication? Britannica. Yeah, Britannica. <laughs> Maybe Newsweek. I have hecklers in the front row. I like it. All right, next question. Um, oh, this one really surprised me when I read it. So during the first quarter of 2012, the top non-PC platform for di digital video and ads. I had no idea this was true. Xbox. Yeah, Xbox. Um, March of 2009, I used this. It's a little bit older, but I still like the statistic, and we'll talk about why this was. Uh, one district warehouse, textbook, still shrink wrapped. How much? Yeah, 4.6 million. 4.6 million. 
Um, this is a shocker. According to learning in the 21st century, what percentage of parents do not think online textbooks are a good idea? Can't always listen to the two people that show up to every board meeting, right? So it's actually 5%. And what's interesting about this, when you start to ask questions about perceptions and what we think versus, what, because oftentimes I'll talk to a superintendent and I'll say, they'll, say, they'll talk about kind of the percentage of people and kids at home who have internet access. And you'll say, well, when did you last survey? And it was two years ago, which seems reasonable, but not for that, right? So two years ago is a huge difference. Things like this, uh, a, a, another interesting in the Speak Up survey, percent, percentage of parents willing to buy a mobile device if their school used them for learning, 62%. Percentage of administrators unlikely to allow mobile devices, just about the same, <laughs> right? And so you see places like, uh, I, this actually didn't go over last week when I was in New York all that well. But in New York City, where they banned cell phones, have you seen these buses? Have you read about this? Entire industry popped up. This, some great entrepreneur has a bus that looks like, it reminds me of the skating, like when I take my kids skating and you, they take your shoes and give you skates and they put your shoes in a box. They take your cell phone for a dollar a day, put it in a little bin, you get a ticket, and then you get your cell phone back after the day. So they literally drive around all day with a bunch of cell phones in the truck. Whole new industry. So there you go. If uh, you have places that are banning cell phones, you can start your truck cell phone business. So which country recently launched an initiative to do tablets? The tablets is an important part of this one. Anybody? Thailand. Yeah, Thailand. You said that? All right, so give yourselves a round of applause. Nicely done. Now, I will forget, so before I forget, if you could not take the little white pad, those are mine, and I'll need them next week. So um, if you could just put them in the center somewhere, that would be great. All right, so here's the question then. When we talk about this from an educational perspective, we talk about this continuum and why we should start to deliver more of our content digitally. It doesn't have to be more, though, but start to systematically, and that means not just those one or two teachers who are doing it already, but as a system, do this. Why from an educational perspective? What are the educational benefits? What do you think? What's that? Why is that? That's what kids do all day, right? They want to engage with content like this. This is how they engage with information in their everyday lives. OK, what else? Anything else? Should we do it just because kids want to do it? Yeah. What's that? Easy to update. What's easy to update? Anything. Great, OK. So the content's easy to update. Anything else? Yeah? Content social. OK, why is that important from an educational perspective? Connect with anyone anywhere, right? So I mean, it was interesting. I mean, one of the things that, that we have to get over in the whole professional development uh, process is moving into a group think, right? And so the reason I want you to talk during this presentation as much as I do is because this room knows a lot more than any one person, certainly. And so how do we mine that, and how do we mine it with our students? It's great. Anything else? Potentially cost effective, right? A way to save money, potentially. Yeah, ma'am? It's engaging. Okay. So let's talk about some of these, and let's talk about the research. So you, you'll see whenever I put up something, uh, there's a source underneath it. And if you want this slide, the last slide that'll come up is my email address. Shoot me an email, I'll shoot you back a Dropbox account, and you can download. I'll, I'll usually do a Keynote file and also a PDF so that you, you can open it if you don't have Keynote. Um, but certainly, feel free to use this. So as you go back to your districts and advocate for digital content, I want you to have everything that you can to have that conversation as well. So let's talk about this educational benefit, because if we put students in the middle, the first thing you said was, this is how students want to engage with content. Right? And so just one quick slide on this. I think we probably all agree on this, but just one quick slide. The Kaiser Family Foundation does a study every four years. How many people are familiar with that study? It talks about students and media. So kids 8 to 18 spend how much time with media a day? Now before you answer, there's a little asterisk to this. This study does not take into account any time in school which would be surprisingly low, right? But it takes school out. So take that block of time out. 
How much time do kids spend with media day? What do you think? Shout it out. Six, four, ten, five and a half. So the research says about seven and a half a day. If you multiply that by seven because they don't take weekends off, it's over 50 hours a week that they're spending consuming information through media. Some of the things that make that up. And if you're really astute, you'll, you'll see that that adds up to more than seven and a half hours. How is that possible? Because they're multitasking, right? So they're actually consuming about 10 and a half hours worth of media a day and information through media a day. So this becomes a snapshot of our students. Have you seen Joe's non netbook? So I'll play it really quickly. Hey, Joe, what are you doing there? I don't know. What do you, what do you, what do you, what's going on? Well, this is some, un, like, this is like a foreign tool. Okay. What was it? You said you were having a problem earlier? Oh, yeah. Wait, where's it? Yeah. So, I want to read more about Frederick Douglass, or maybe, like, see a larger image. So I double-clicked on the picture, but nothing's happening. Oh. And, uh, then I, I can't really read the text because it's kind of small, so I'm looking for the system preferences so I can make the text bigger, but I can't find anything. Laura, you said there, there was a, a problem involved? You can't double click the image because it's not blue highlighted. Oh. And the, the words you don't know, you can't, they're not blue highlighted, so you can't. Well, wait, click. cotton is king, that's kind of, that's blue. You know, what are you, do, what are you doing there? So you get the idea. So the second thing we said was we can update the content, right? And I said, what do you mean by that? And you said, everything. You can update everything. So let me ask you this question. If you had a textbook that was five, year, five years old, what things in it might not be factually correct or might not be represented, right? So let me give you the first one. I'll give you, I'm going to take the easy one out of the conversation. So my five-year-old textbook still thinks George Bush is president of the United States, right? Fair enough. It used to say four years old. I had to change it. So I want you to, in your groups, real quickly, I'll give you about a minute, finish this sentence as many times as you can and then we'll report out. So go ahead and finish that sentence as many times in your groups as you can and we'll have a, a quick discussion about it. Oh, can you not hear? No, I'll let them know. Is it because the echo or is it because you just can't hear the sound? Okay, I'll let them know. To turn it up maybe a little bit. No, I mean, what's the device? Oh, it's a uh, um, Kindle Fire. Oh, nice. You like it? All right, what do you think? What are some of those things? Shout them out. Anybody? What's that? Pluto is not a planet, right? And so one of the great things about digital content is, now, between us, we all know Pluto should have never been a planet. But one of... <laughs> Oh my God, I've come to the one state where everybody loves Pluto, apparently. I was just kidding, it was a joke. All right, but one of the great things about this is you can represent that it with was digital in content. distant region, the outer solar system, that in the year 2006, astronomy was shaken to its very core. After almost 80 years, Pluto lost its status as the ninth planet. The International Astronomical Union couldn't ignore findings that similar, even larger bodies than Pluto traverse the outer solar system, forced to define the word for the first time. Astronomers establish three distinct criteria to earn the name planet. First, the You're going to have to log into our service to find out what those criteria are. But what are some other ones? No Arab Spring. No Arab Spring. Arab Spring. Good. Yep, way up in the back. Shout it out. Still looking for Bin Laden. Good. 
<laughs> you know, I read about that, and apparently if you put them in a shelf, they will last forever, too. So if you just buy one and don't go after it. Wow, that's a, yeah. All right, anything else? Yeah. Bring your own drink. Oh, BYOD means bring your own drink. <laughs> Good. Yeah, up front. The only tea party happened a long time ago in Boston. Ah, tea party had a whole other meaning. Good, yeah. No tablets. Anything else? Oh, clouds are white and in the sky. Very good. Yeah, good. All right, how about one more? Yeah, hurricanes, right? That's why I live in Pennsylvania. No earthquakes, no hurricanes. You just have to deal with snow, which you're willing to take. Oh, one more. Go ahead. Yeah, tablet is paper. Great. So there are a lot of things that happen all the time. Um, the Higgs boson particle, so a whole new particle was discovered recently. One of the, um, one of the interesting things that I've had the opportunity to do uh, at Discovery about four years ago. Uh, how many people are familiar with our, our streaming service? Just a quick show of hands. So about four years ago, we created a, 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 a digital version alternative to a textbook. We actually launched it in Oregon. Um, we were asked by the state to go through the traditional textbook adoption process. Uh, how many people are familiar with the textbook adoption process in other states? Yeah. So the way that works is there's this committee, right? And they have all these criteria. First, they start with the standards. And, and your book has to match all the standards and reflect all the standards, um, have, the, uh, have the right type of content. And so it goes through a committee review, often made up of teachers and administrators. So about three years ago, maybe about two and a half, uh, I was in the state of Florida. And I had the opportunity to present to the state committee our digital solution for a traditional textbook adoption process. So it's exactly what you think. It was Pearson, Houghton, Mifflin, McGraw-Hill, and, and Discovery, and people were figuring out what we're doing there. And so as part of that committee presentation, very formal, the person from the Department of Ed said to me, he said, Mr. Kinney, I have an important question for you, and I want to remind you that you are being recorded, which um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an educator. Um, but I've been around enough of them to know what that means. And so he said, have you updated your content since you, since you submitted it for adoption? And the whole idea through adoption is about six months beforehand, you send in your book, the committee reviews the book, and for the next six years, it does not change, right? So that's the way it traditionally works. So what do you think the right answer to that question was? Absolutely not. We submitted it six months ago, and for the next six years, we will not change a thing, right? That are, that's the rules. Now, what was the real answer? Absolutely, we change it all, and that's what I said. I'm like, yeah, we change it all the time. <laughs> Not willy-nilly, but, you know, have you looked out the window? In Florida, about two and a half years ago, there was something that affected every single kid in that state, or will affect every single kid in that state. Anybody have an idea what that was? Something going on in the Gulf. The oil spill. I was literally presenting during the oil spill, and we had Philippe Cousteau covering the oil spill, and I said, you know what? Within a week, we'll have content on the oil spill in the Florida textbook, in the appropriate place, that matches your state standards, that's at the right grade level. And that's important, right? And so we have the ability to update content regularly. Why wouldn't we? Right? Because the other thing, and, and again, ma'am, what was your name? Oh, Fran. Fran. What Fran said was, you can update everything, right? She didn't just say content, which most people do. She said everything. because. When we adopt new standards in states, what happens to all your instructional materials the day you adopt new standards? Right? How many people in here have heard teachers say, my instructional materials no longer match the standards, nor do they match what I'm going to be assessed on? Have you heard that? Right? So you can make those changes as well. So the flexibility of that content becomes really important. Here's the one thing we didn't say, which I think to me is the most important thing. We now have the ability through technology and digital content to meet the needs of all our learners in the class, right? And so let me ask, uh, well, let me share this with you. This is a research study. It's a little bit old, 2003, but I like it because I kind of like what it stands for. They went into a developing country and they broke sixth graders into two different groups. I'm sorry, six-year-olds into two different groups, so roughly first graders. Math content, they delivered the content in two different ways, text only or text, images, animation, and sound. Then they assess those students. 
Now, knowing nothing more about this study, but being educators, how many people think text only did better? Who thinks text with other stuff did better? Right? It's not rocket science. Why? You're right, by the way. Why? Keeps her attention. What was that? Because it matches different learning styles, right? Here's a fun thing you can do with your, with your staffs when you go back. Oh, don't ignore that one. What are some of the ways we learn? By doing. By doing? What else? By watching. By watching. Listening. Stories. Stories. Reading. Okay. So when you ask this question, most of the time people will, will talk about the VARC category, so Fleming's work. And I'm not saying this is the definitive work in this area. All I'm saying is this is what most people will talk about. They'll talk about visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Most people, who said reading? Who was it? Most people never say reading, ironically. If you ask a, a room full of people, most people won't say reading, so that's great. Uh, and so here are the different categories. Now, here's the beauty of this. If you look at each of these, this is how we can meet the needs of all our students. So here's what I want you to do. Take your cell phones back out. I'm going to ask you the second question in my series of two here. If you had to say you are one of these, and again, I recognize you're not just one, you're a combination, but if you had to put yourself in one group, which one would you say you are? Are you visual, auditory, read, write, or kinesthetic? So again, you can either text the keyword to this number, 37607, or go to the website. So I'll give you about a minute, maybe a minute and a half to fill that out. Bless you. Okay, I'll give you about 15 more seconds. Okay, I need a volunteer with a good memory. You don't have to get up. Just raise your hand. One of you two guys right there. Anybody? Good memory, somebody in the front? It's an easy one, I promise. All right, Jeff, perfect. Jeff has a great memory. All right, so Jeff, can you generally just remember what's on the screen? So about 50% of the people said visual, 10%, 10%, and about a quarter said kinesthetic. Got it? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Everybody take a look at this question you just answered. Let's compare it to the one I asked you right before this. How do we match up? What are we mostly, Jeff? Visual. Visual. Hmm. What, what's the second one? Hands on. So we actually did pretty well on that one. So let's take a look at this next slide. Over about the last year and a half, I've asked this question um, to every group that I've been with. And I've taken out everything except for North America. So I left in the data for US and Canada. So I've taken out any international data, not Canada. And I started with this question, if you remember. We said, in which way do you believe instructional content is primarily delivered in your school? Here's what we said. About 70% said lecture, which is pretty close to here. I think it was a little lower here. About 13% said text, 10% hands-on, and 6% media. I think we had a zero on that one here. Okay. And then we asked the second question, right? So we asked, which describes us as adults? Here's what we said. What do you think? Do you like the connect? So this is what's interesting to me. As adults, and I think this is probably skewed because we're adults, it would probably even be more to the right. Um, if we asked our kids. But this is what's interesting. If we're 
to design schools for the first time around instructional content and how we learn, we literally couldn't get it any worse. It's the exact opposite of how we deliver information versus how we choose to learn it. So the question then is, how do we overcome that, right? And so this is the beauty of content. This is the beauty of digital, which is no matter how we learn, we can efficiently meet the needs of our learners. And so we see things like read, write. Can we deliver text digitally? Sure we can, right? So no one's saying it shouldn't be rich text. This is um, just a quick example, though. One of the things we can do with text is we can do a whole lot of different things. We can define words within the text. We can define words in different ways. We can do it visually. We can do it through text. We can do it through videos. We can switch languages if we choose to. So we can build in all these supports as we're reading. Or we can take away those supports and these scaffold it if we choose to. Have a greater volume than this smaller rock. Along with that, we can switch languages, right? So we can take our, our text, change languages. While it's in diff a different language, we can highlight things. We can have it read to us. This is the power of technology. Right? And so it's not just An about delivering text, but it's providing those supports as well. Volume. Can we deliver things for the auditory learner? Who, where are our auditory learners? A few in the front. I'm an auditory learner. We had, um, I, I'm going to a meeting with our CEO over the next couple of days in, in New York, and he sent two books uh, in the mail. Everybody has to read two books before the meeting. Well, it was the first thing I did for my auditory learners. I went right to iTunes and downloaded them both, and then listened to them over the next couple of days. Because I, 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 I learn better this way. Like, I can retain that. And so, can we deliver content for auditory learners? Of course. Matt Suter's survival testifies to the human skeleton's extraordinary resilience. But when we consciously want to test our strength, our muscles and bones collaborate to give us maximum power. How about John Medina's book, Brain Rules? Anybody read that? Back there? Oh, a couple people. So John Medina is a, is a, a cognitive um, psychologist out of Stanford. Right? So he studies how the brain works and how we learn. Not an educator, and he says that up front. And so brain rule number 10 is this one. Vision trumps all other senses. Okay. So I thought we'd put that to the test today a little bit. So here's what I want you to do. In your teams, I want you to do this. I want you to look up here, and I want you to identify as many of these as you can just visually. Okay? We're not going to use technology, so I want you to write it down. So if your team captain could jot it down, we're on the honor system. Identify these if you can. All right, I'll give you about 30 more seconds. All right, what do you think? So we're going to start in the upper left, up here. What is it? Yeah. On three. One, two, three. Yeah. Kit Kat. Very good. How about we'll go to the middle, so we'll go this direction. What's next? Yeah. Twix. How about the next one? Yeah. Butterfinger. You know, I got to tell you, I was, um, I, I used this slide in a presentation in Canada a few weeks back. So there's two things I learned. One is candy bars don't necessarily, they, they travel across the border, but not always with the same name. Did you know that? Yeah, so everybody's yelling at me that I'm wrong. I'm like, nope, I'm right. Um, but the second thing was, there was a young lady in the back right-hand corner. Um, I was at a school, and she put her hands over her face. She cringed when I put the slide up. And I got about halfway through it, 
and she did it again. I said, ma'am, I have to stop. Like, how have I offended you with this? And she, she was the health and nutrition expert for the district. <laughs> so she, she asked me to use healthy snacks, uh, but I haven't got to it yet. So how about the next one, this one? Almond Joy. Almond Joy, good. Next one? Yeah. Good. Next one? Car Caramella, good. How about here? You know, I gotta say, I'm a little offended this is the most engaged you've been the entire <laughs> presentation. Um, all right, so Rolo, good. How about the next one? Milky Way. Any, does anybody have them all correct so far? Any teams, a few? All right, last one? Heath Bar, good. Except it's not a Heath Bar. Who said it? Who got it right the first time? Honor system. Score, very good, very good. So, all right, give yourselves a round of applause. Very good. Who got them all right? One? Anybody else? One over there? One over there? All right, you three come up real quick. All right, there you go. You have to share, though. You have to share. Oh, these are easy to share. Oh, you can't take a few, take them all. But just share them all, though. Take some back to your team. I'm assuming you didn't do all the work yourself. Nice. <laughs> all right. So here, here's the idea, right? This is an example of something that's not high tech, right? This is just a simple learning object. What, who is this good for? Face value, just looking at the screen, who is this good for? What kind of learner? Visual learner, right? So do traditional materials do a nice job at this? Sure, I've seen stuff like this, right? Here's what they can't do. So we have our visual learner. Who do we just get involved? Kinesthetic, right? Because now they can interact with the content. They can move it around. Now, whether they get it right or wrong, they're going to get some support on the left-hand side. It tapes the form of text. So now who do we have? We have our read-write learner. And now we can have that text read to us if we choose to. Who do we get now? All living things go through a this was the power of technology, Bees right? This is the efficiency and the tools that we can provide teachers to put into practice great instructional practice, right? And so this is how we meet the needs of all learners and do it in a really manageable way. And so one of the things that we often talk about is the disconnect between this kind of teaching and tests, right? But here's the reality. There's no research that supports great teaching and kids in those classes do poorly on tests. It's, it doesn't exist, right? When Carolyn Tomlinson years ago wrote about differentiation, it was it supported by increases in student achievement, right? And so here's another research study from that book I talked about. If you take any one sense and deliver content and any second sense, and then combine the first two. Doesn't matter what those senses are. Pick one, pick another one, and then do a combination of the two. What happens? Better recall, but more importantly, the second one. People can make connections because they have more to draw from, right? And so problem solving increases. So we can start to solve things that we couldn't solve otherwise. And so I'm going to skip the formative assessment piece. Does it make a difference? And so this is really the fun that I get to have all the time is working with districts through this transition from print to digital and watching kids engaged and watching different types of learners engaged. And so we th see things like Charlotte, where we've worked for about four years. Specifically so in this quick learning clip. community, we saw our student gains um, over 25% in one year, which was just remarkable growth. Um, we, my goal for this learning community was double digit growth, which is 10%. Let's see if we can attain 10% and bring, you know, uh, bring our student, our level of student achievement up. Three to 5% is healthy growth, but we, we, we knew that we could do at least 10. But when we saw that we had accomplished more than 25%, that was, that was amazing. Certainly we've seen uh, a huge um, jump in our student achievement results, particularly in the area of science. Um, but some um, growth as well in reading and math, um, particularly at our elementary schools. Science. All right, so here's the question then. Right, we've, we've talked for about 45 minutes about the educational benefits of digital content. So the question is then, why aren't we all doing it? Right? We have the administration talking about it. We have the Secretary of Ed talking about it. We're talking about it. What are the barriers? Money? 
time. What does money buy? Let's, let's go just a, one step deeper in the money. What, is money. what would money get you that you don't have? Training. Oh, good. What was the other one? Hardware and software. Connectivity. Good. Fear. What do you mean by fear? Okay. Fe who, who's fearful, do you think? Adults. Fear of change. Okay. Anything else? Time. Anything else? Good. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of these um, in, in different ways. So the one thing that we hear a lot is um, an equity issue, right? So there's, there's a, and it's the, probably the biggest thing in our work that we run into is people will say things like, it's not fair to those kids who don't have the internet at home. Right? How do you switch to digital if they don't, if not everybody can access a home? So how many people have heard that? So let's talk about that a little bit. How many kids are there that don't access the internet? So of all teens, what percentage frequently use the internet? That doesn't mean they have it at home. So I, I phrase that very specifically and I want to point it out because I want to be fair. But what percentage of teens frequently use the internet? 95? Yeah, not in school. U.S., thank you. Yep, U.S. statistic. 95? It's pretty close. So it's 94, give or take 5%. Pretty big margin of error. So about 94%, let's talk about who those 6% are. So of those 6%, where are they likely to fall on household income? What do you think? Right, it's obvious, under 30,000. Okay. How about this one? Education level of the parents. Who do you think they are? The biggest determining factor is this one, right? You know which one it is, but look at the difference, right? And so we basically know they come from lower SES homes. Their parents typically have less than a high school degree of, the, of that 6%. And so here's our solution. We know they need it. We know they have to interact with, with technology and digital content to be successful in the world, to get a job. Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that. And so our solution is, it's not fair to them to do it at school. We hear this all the time, right? It doesn't make any sense. The FCC chairman has talked about, we were in a meeting with him um, about two weeks ago with a number of superintendents from across the country, and this is one of the things that he talked about, which is, in today's world, you have to have broadband to get a job. And it's not to get a high-tech job, it's to get a job anywhere. It's to get a job at Walmart and Target, because they're only posting online or you have to go in and work on the kiosk to get a job, right? You have to apply on a computer. So it's not about providing, it's not about an equity because if we don't provide those students access at school, we've just locked them out of a future, right? And so the question then comes to money oftentimes. That's why I started with Mooresville and, I, and I'll talk about it a little bit here. Mooresville is an interesting case because over their five years of going digital, They've done amazing things with all of their, their metrics that they look at. So graduation rates have clearly gone up. Uh, they're second in the state in North Carolina. There's 115 districts in North Carolina. This actually is one year old. I actually had dinner with uh, some folks from Mooresville last night before I came up. They're now second in, the, in their state. So of 115 districts, they're second academically. But the most interesting thing here is this statistic. Their per pupil expenditure now is not 99th, it's actually 100 out of 115. How'd they do it? They spent their money differently. They didn't have more money. They just chose differently. One of the, the greatest things I ever heard was their CFO speak to another group of CFOs at an event, and she talked about how it's changed their instructional practice, which you would expect. They have gone so far as they buy different types of desks in their classrooms, right? Because they want kids to collaborate. They want them to talk to each other, except in the high school where they couldn't afford them. And I wanted to stop her and rewind it and play it over and over again. It's not a wealthy district. It's a district that can't afford the types of desks they want in their high school because they've chosen to spend it on digital content and on technology, right? And it becomes a community initiative. I had a laugh, Tom, when, when you mentioned, you know, go downtown and buy things. It reminded me of Mark Edwards, because that's the first thing he would say if you visited Mooresville. Visit our local community, spend some money downtown, because they're really supportive of our schools and this initiative. And so this is how we tend to spend money. 
school districts don't need, but they have to take them. That's because it's the law. Channel A's Chris Hawes has more on that story tonight. Chris? Gloria, there are thousands of books inside this building's warehouse. Most are new. They've never even been opened. But now one local representative has a plan to stop the waste. Irving ISD high school students use about six textbooks for their classes, but this administrator estimates about half those books are also available online, an option the tech-savvy students almost all prefer. Why should you have two copies of the textbook, one on your laptop and one on your back, and just make your life a whole lot easier and not have to carry around that book, and risk losing the book as well? That means this Irving ISD warehouse is full of unused books, workbooks, and manuals about 146,000 of them. Are you running out of space? Uh, yeah, slightly. The solution might seem obvious. Order fewer books and use the money saved where it's actually needed. But it's not that simple. The state requires that we order a textbook for each student enrolled in the course. Whether you need them or not. Whether you need them or not. OK, so I'm a big supporter of education. Is this their fault? Right? Is it the school district's fault? No, why do they do it? Because they have to, right? It's a state law. It's interesting. So take a guess when the state law was enacted. You've seen this presentation. <laughs> have you seen this before? Are you kidding me? You just guessed 1918? That's the answer. So 1918. Very good. 1918. So this law was passed in 1918. And there was something else significant that happened in 1918. It took me a while to research this. It was over a weekend. I found this invention that took place. It was something called the interrupter gear. Anybody know what this is? Anybody? Every once in a while, you know? Oh, could you stand up and really shout it out so everybody hears you? Because this is it's impressive that you know this. That's great. What's your name? Bob. Let's give a round of applause for Bob for knowing the interrupter here. So what, what, this is fascinating to me. So basically, before the invention of jets, you know, fighter planes would be, their guns would be behind their own propellers. So when you shot an enemy, you were taking a crack at your own propeller. And you can Google this, I'm not making it up, and you can find propellers that have bullet holes in them. So the interrupter gear in 1918 was, was invented to momentarily stop your propeller, bullet passes, it goes on. You know, so fast that we don't even notice it, nothing happens to the plane. Now, if you're a fighter pilot in 1918, this has got to be just about the coolest invention ever, right? I mean, you're pretty excited that you're not going to shoot your own propeller. <laughs> Do we need them anymore? Do our fighter jets have propellers? Right? So great invention at the time, but out of touch, out of date. And that's where we are with content in our schools. And so we see a number of states who are aggressively moving to change this, right? You saw it in Florida, a uh, big leader. Even saw it in Texas, to be fair. Texas last year when they went out for a supplemental adoption uh, did an online supplemental adoption, so not their traditional print. Because this is our future, and these are my twins going to school, and I did not pack those backpacks. No joke. I didn't stuff them with anything. I mean, that's literally what they're carrying. And you know, when I get home, I'll pick them up from school, and they'll run to the car, and the first thing they do is call the iPad, right? Because we only have one, I know, bad dad. But the three of them will fight over it, right? And they'll say, I call the iPad, I want it first, because they'll, they'll huck these things off and call the iPad. And so if you want a copy of this presentation, shoot me a note at my email there, scott underscore kinney at discovery.com. Use it, advocate for it. You're truly the ones that are going to go back and lead this, or not lead this, right, within your school systems, because you're the leaders in the state. And so thank you very much for your time. It's been wonderful speaking with you. I appreciate your interaction. And I will uh, turn it back over. <laughs>